I think we are a provider, and usually I add the most beautiful provider of digital services, communication, but also ICT for uh, enterprises. It's important as an IT leader to uh, be very close to that context of the company, to really well understand where we're heading, what the important priorities are, what that means in terms of our market that we, uh, that we are in. And then, of course, uh, uh, shape an organization that is able to, uh, to deliver on that. But it is also capable, especially these days, to themselves bring new ideas to the table. I feel that, that, that generally people sometimes feel too much constraints and reasons why things are not possible. While of course you will find examples of the opposite, I sometimes realize that things at first sight might look more complex than they are. And so I very much believe, and then I'm also trying, I think, to, 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 to promote that a bit, uh, the belief that there is a solution to every problem. This is Seana TV. My name is Hendrik Dekkers. I'm here today with Geert Goethals, who is the Chief Information Officer at Proximus. A very warm welcome, Geert. Thanks for having me, Hendrik. Geert, you have a Master in Electronic Engineering and IT from the University of Ghent. And you started your career in 1994 uh, as a network engineer at the uh, new mobile operator Proximus. Uh, and ever since you have worked at uh, Proximus in different roles. Um, one of your last roles was CIO CTO of the International Carrier Services Company. And since 2016, you're the CIO of the Proximus Group. So Geert, tell us a little bit more about yourself. What's your background? Who are you really? And how did you arrive in this position? So indeed, I, uh, I started back in uh, back in '94 in uh, in the uh, pioneering operations, I would say, of, of mobile in Belgium. Very interesting uh, uh, times, uh, because indeed it was the first steps that we uh, we were all taking in uh, uh, digital mobile technology. Uh, a lot to be discovered because we also created a new joint venture uh, company for that. Um, so I think uh, a great opportunity to discover lots of many different things because we were only few people uh, as well. Uh -huh. Then indeed uh, uh, took on different, uh, different roles within the group um, and although it's all more or less the same group and company, um, I must say it's, uh, it feels like different jobs in, in, in of course also a world that has changed uh, significantly since then. Okay, super. So Telco is still a, a booming business, I would, uh, I would say a changing business as well. Uh, but we also live in special times. We come out of the pandemic, as there's, there's global instability, there's inflation, there's many things changing at the moment. So in Telco specific and, and, and at Proximus, what are really the drivers, the most important drivers of change and how is business reacting uh, to them? Well, I think indeed, as you say, um, it's, it's, I think, stating the obvious, as we say, that a lot of things are changing uh, in a lot of industries and certainly in, in, uh, in telecommunications as well. Um, I think what uh, the ambition that we have uh, in that space is certainly not to be just a connectivity provider, but I think the focus is really on uh, making sure that we are uh, becoming a real, call it a custodian of digital experiences. Um, I think that also means that we uh, uh, somewhat evolved to, uh, to being uh, a tech company at the core. Um, and, and really, and, and I think we, we, we've been very clear on that as part of our strategy as well, really behaving and operating as, an, as a digital native company in that space. Okay, super. Now, in order to support that change, the business change that is uh, never ending, I can imagine at, uh, at a company like uh, Proximus, you have put the last couple of years a lot of focus on transforming the IT landscape within the organization. So what was really the burning issue? What needed to change? Well, I think if you um, if you look at our uh, um, at our strategy that we expressed uh, back in uh, in 2020, uh, I think as part of these digital ambitions, uh, I think it was clear that we we realized that there were a number of important things to be changed on our IT to be able to support that uh, really that ambition. Um, I think if looking at our IT landscape, it's an um, we brought pieces together from different operations. Uh, you had mobile operations, fixed operations, ICT business. I think each already. Uh, with somewhat uh, of a complex IT stack uh, that has also, I would say, incrementally evolved uh, over the years uh, by, through projects and new things that we wanted to, uh, to add on. Uh, but of course, over time, having led to uh, some level of duplication in that landscape, uh, uh, not always perfect and, and, and reusable integration, um, I think especially as you think about data, maybe not uh, um, the most suitable data architecture um, and so the result of that is of course as you want to continue making more changes to that and, and especially you want to do that uh, more quickly 
that you, uh, you reach the limits of that. Uh, things get more complex, get more labor intensive, um, require more effort. Yep. Um, and in the end, of course, uh, have also an, uh, an, uh, a price tag. So um, I think that's, that's, that's really the, um, uh, the, the key element that we, uh, that we had to work on. So your challenge was really to modernize, let's say, the IT landscape. So how do you go about addressing that, uh, that challenge? Indeed, so I think that's, uh, that's of course a good uh, um, and an important question that we asked ourselves. Um, how do you really do that? Um, I think one of, the, um, one of the elements that was very clear from the start is that certainly what we did want to do is uh, what probably a lot of us have uh, experienced already, which is like launching a big monolithic uh, project where you change everything in one go. These days um, <laughs> and it's um, Where of course uh, you have, uh, as we know, always difficulties to contain the timing and the, uh, uh, and, and the cost of such an undertaking. So, so that was really not what we want to do. And then of course you ask yourself the question, is there a different way of doing this? Is there a way we can um, slice that elephant, uh, do it maybe in a more step-by-step -step approach, but also, of course, not wait years for having uh, some, of the, uh, some of the returns of that. So trying to do that in, an, in, an, in a step-by-step -step way, but also creating, if you want, on the approach that we applied, a level of confidence through the realization of intermediate uh, uh, benefits. Yep. Um, and so that has really been what, we, uh, what we've uh, put in motion. Yeah. So you've gone about it with a step-by-step process basically. So can you describe a little bit the different steps? So um, I think indeed um, if, you, um, if you think about the, 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 the longer term uh, ambition, um, the question is of course what do, you, what do you want to evolve to? I think um, then let's indeed start with I would say the easiest part, still very complex but the easiest part, uh, what, 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 is the, what is the target solution and how does it look like? And so what we try to do is at least a bit, if you want, not too much connected to current issues and constraints, what would that architecture look like? And what would our landscape be if you consider the kind of operations that we have, uh, the kind of products that we sell, the processes that we need to support, how would that, uh, how would that look like? And, and we did that based on, I would say, standard uh, architecture frameworks uh, to really define what uh, that modular architecture uh, would look like. Now, once you have that, the question is, how do you evolve from A to B? Yeah. Um, so I think what we try to do is really to, um, if you want kind of, map a bit our current environment to that uh, dream landscape, if you want. Um, and then, of course, trying to identify what the key areas are that we need to address first to, uh, um, to, create, to, to, to create the results. Um, I think, as in many cases, it led to a kind of, um, uh, I would say, Pareto law, because I think if you look at an overall landscape with maybe, I think it was around 170 functional domains, uh, that probably by addressing structurally a 30, 40 of these that you create uh, most of the benefits. And can you mention a couple of these? So indeed, in terms of, um, in terms of, uh, of examples, um, I think it's really about, as I mentioned, working away some of the legacy that we have. Legacy being, for example, older platforms. But I think legacy also in the sense um, that you have uh, um, duplication in the landscape and so that you want to make sure that you create unique uh, capabilities and services that you can use yep. uh, for all of the products and the journeys that you, uh, that you develop. Example of that is, for example, the product catalog space, uh, where you want to have um, one central product catalog, which is um, also in its management fully automated, fully integrated with all of the components around it. Mm -hmm. um, of course, leading to much more flexibility on, on introducing new services, um, but also, um, uh, also making sure that by doing this, you create a uh, uh, consistent experience for users across the various uh, channels that we have. Yeah. Uh, I think other element in the servicing space is, an, uh, is one where we consolidate, in fact, all of the uh, systems and applications that maybe before were a bit more focused on specific segments or products onto one single cloud solution, um, which then allows to have an integrated view of what, uh, um, what a customer has. And of course, supporting, uh, I would say, a first time ride type uh, um, experience with customers. Yeah. So this program is, I mean, it's quite an extensive undertaking, right? So, so where are you today and what, is still, what still remains to be done? So indeed, although it's, um, it's not a one monolithic thing, as I said, uh, um, it's still an extensive piece of work with many initiatives in different areas. And I think that's also the beauty of it. It's in a way, uh, if you want by design, a modular thing where we address some of these pieces one by one. Um, allowing as well to do more at the same time or less uh, because some of these things can be managed quite uh, independently. Yeah. So, um, and, and of course also interesting I think in terms of uh, how you combine that with maybe other uh, uh, demand that, that, that still is, is, is to be delivered is the fact that it, because of the fact that some of it is really 
centered a bit on particular areas of IT, it kind of allows to, to, to spread also some of the effort across the IT environment. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the, the realized benefits, the results. What is, I mean, you're working on this for, what is it, two years two now? Two years now. So what has been achieved uh, until today? Well, I think a lot has happened. Um, I think we, uh, we are not fully there, uh, but I think a lot of uh, uh, good progress is there on some of the bigger undertakings that are maybe not fully finished, but that are generating already uh, uh, some results. Also smaller things that have been done already, and I think uh, also good to see that we have been able to really, if you want, tick some boxes uh, uh, and to phase out some older applications and really fully consolidating it onto, uh, uh, onto a landscape, mm -hmm. a new landscape. Um, and I think what, what is really uh, great to see, uh, uh, if you look at the results, for example, in terms of IT efficiency that we had in mind with, with quite uh, strong ambitions on that. Um, so we put that in motion as, as part of a five-year plan. Yep. That now, two years down the road, we've been able to realize 70% of that uh, yep. uh, already this year. And is there a way to... to, to calculate the return of that in money-wise, in, 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 in new functionalities, I don't know, time to market and money saved. Is, is there any way that you can uh, measure that? I think indeed there's, um, there's, there's certainly ways to, uh, to, to measure it. And to be honest, we're, we're quite, uh, I would say, rigidly tracking that because we invest quite some money into yeah. the transformation. And so we want to make sure that the benefits are there. One component is for sure uh, uh, efficiency, as I mentioned, uh, uh, um, cost efficiency. Mm -hmm. And that I think is really possible through um, each of the initiatives or if you want part of an not overly sophisticated, but clear business case where we see what is the level of investment that we need, where do we want to uh, uh, realize these benefits and are these really traceable benefits and can we integrate them as part of our plan. Of course, next to that, it is also about, uh, it's not only cost, uh, not, not at all, uh, it's also about indeed uh, evolving our architecture, so indeed it supports the agility that mm -hmm. we require for the future and in many cases significant uh, uh, improvements I would say in terms of how we run the operations, yeah. the interactions with customers um, and of course time to market for new, uh, new products. Okay, now I can imagine that your team's IT team is, 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 in, has a, is, is a big team within, within uh, Proximus, IT is, is core in, in the operation. Uh, so the percentage of, of, uh, of the revenue spent in IT must be quite important. Is, there, is it easy for you to, um, to benchmark how much you spent on IT compared to other uh, telco companies around the world? Is, is that an easy thing and, uh, and how, where would you say that you situate yourself today? But I think indeed uh, global, global benchmarks, um, I would say, are always pretty challenging mm -hmm. eh, because you can start from an, uh, a big high level number. Uh, but then, of course, there's many factors that influence, uh, um, I would say, the, uh, especially as, as you talk about cost, I would say the cost components mm -hmm. of, an, of an IT infrastructure, for example, of a telco. Eh, because as you especially think about telco, uh, there's operators like ourselves that still have a significant part of assets, which are our own assets yeah. in terms of our networks. But of course, behind that also, all of the IT systems to manage that, to provision yeah. that, uh, etc. While of course you could also look at operators which are virtually, uh, um, which are virtual operators, yeah. uh, which which do not have an extensive uh, an extensive capability um, in, in in that particular space. But I think it still allows. If then you dive a little some level deeper, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's still possible to uh, uh, to compare um, apples to apples, I would say. And it's of course something that we use significantly yep. as part of our exercise to really see where are potentially the levers yep. and which are the areas that potentially we need to focus on to make a difference. Okay. Tell me a little bit how your different teams were involved in, in, in this uh, big reorganization of your IT landscape. But I think um, uh, clearly if you look at all what needs to happen is the teams that need to do it. So I think we've been uh, from the start very much focused on making sure that we integrate them in that journey from day one. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the bigger ambitions have been, have been defined. And after that, we've really started engaging with the teams um, to build still an ambitious plan, but one that we can execute, because in the end, uh, uh, that's what we expect to, uh, to do. Uh, so we really engage with the teams and, and I must say, the big majority of initiatives is initiatives that were brought to the table, ideas from the teams that they further worked out with indeed the business cases that go with it, um, together with an implementation plan and then started working on that. Mm -hmm. um, and I must say that that, that way of working, um, I've been really impressed by, by a lot of imagination of people to, uh, to really, uh, uh, if you want to open up every drawer and every cabinet and, and to leave no stone unturned to, uh, to fulfill that ambition with, with a set of uh, relevant initiatives. Yeah. Now, changing the architecture is, is, is one thing, 
but uh, you also require a, a very aligned way of working uh, with the teams and, and with your people. So how did you work on that? How do you achieve that? So indeed, architecture is, uh, is, is one component, but I think uh, especially um, if we want to be, if we want to be fast moving, if we want to be um, a company that, 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 of course, as I said, put uh, the customer first, um, we need big focus as well on, on, on things like net promoter score. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we need to do different things, but especially also, uh, uh, I would say, do things differently. And um, I think uh, in terms of way of working, we have been I cannot even say experimenting, I think it was even good deployment of agile practices in many uh, parts of the organization. Um, but roughly a year ago, we started uh, somewhat of a bigger journey where we brought, I would say, all of the pieces together uh, and really see what it means for Proximus as a whole. And especially uh, if you look at the area where you talk about, indeed, developing uh, new products and services, but also uh, all of the critical tooling for customer-facing teams, um, mm -hmm. how we could change that. Um, and of course, as you talk about Agile, there's many, uh, uh, many options and there's also many reasons why you could do it. And I think uh, uh, if you read books on it, you will find the 15 good reasons why to do Agile. Um, but I think in our case, we really try to uh, focus the whole transformation on the things that we believe that really matter to Proximus. Mm -hmm. And so we defined three clear objectives on that Agile transformation that matter to us. It's... Um, First of all, what I mentioned on customer centricity mm -hmm. and making sure that we indeed we have that uh, continued and increased focus on net promoter score of customers. Um, secondly, it's about agility, call it time to market, really right. making sure that we can be uh, uh, faster on that. And I think last but not least, uh, also making sure that it's contributing significantly to employee engagement. Okay, and, and working in a more agile way, more together with the business, how did that change the IT organization? So um, I think, in terms of agile transformation, and, and, and sometimes I'm surprised that uh, as you talk to, uh, to, uh, to other, uh, other colleagues and other companies that uh, some companies see the kind of integration between IT and, and the business as a kind of second step in an agile transformation, which is always a bit uh, strange to me, because I think that's something that we also truly believe in, and it's something that we have integrated in our approach as of day one, to really strive for that, and make sure indeed that we create fully integrated teams um, that as much as possible bring together the competences to work on an end-to-end -end, uh, end -end product. Um, now, of course, as you think about the IT around that, um, there could be pretty easy solutions to get that implemented. You take all of your IT, you cut it into pieces, you put them, in our case, we uh, have based our, our model on a Spotify-based model. Mm -hmm. You put all of these resources in little squads and you put them in tribes and, and the thing is done. Yeah. Um, but I think, and, and I think there's companies that have that experience that potentially it comes with other uh, uh, dysfunctions. Uh, and so what we really try to, uh, from the start, to also very much integrate is a, a couple of other elements and concerns around the management of an IT environment uh, that we should not neglect. Mm -hmm. Think about transformation. We mentioned transformation. Of course, what we don't want to do is change the operating model and then find out that the focus on the transformation, which is very crucial, uh, gets lost. Um, architecture is important, and I think we can if you want change and update and clean a bit the architecture, but of course we also want to make sure over time that that architecture remains consistent. So how do we build that uh, in into, uh, into the model? Uh, there's things like security, um, but also the quality of what you deliver, the effectiveness of how you deliver the IT uh, uh, development. And last but not least, I think also very important, um, how do you ensure still on the IT front the development of people? Yeah. And how do, you, how do you bring all of that together then? So um, I think that's, um, as I said, one of, the, one of the overarching principles in terms of how we changed the IT organization was for sure to maximize the number of people that in a dedicated way you can integrate into agile squads and tribes. Mm -hmm. To really make sure that you have, if you want as much as possible, that combination of people that are close to what customers want and the people that have, if you want, the capacity to, uh, to implement it. But then, of course, making sure that also one of the other elements that I mentioned, uh, that is taken into account. Um, and of course, if you look at some of the uh, setups that you can imagine, there is limitations uh, to what you can achieve in terms of making that model fully dedicated in each of the domains. Yeah. Think about common platforms, for example. Um, uh, think about uh, um, some of the transformation pieces where you want specific focus on uh, a transformation initiative. Um, but also, um, in, in some cases, particular expertise that maybe you don't have massively available and that you don't need all the time in each of the tribes. And so in that case, what we, uh, um, what we added on to, uh, to the model, if you want, is what we called enabling tribes. Mm -hmm. It's tribes that still operate the same way, 
use the same agile methodologies, um, but bring together these resources and offer, if you want, these services to the rest of the organization according yeah. to the priorities of the channel segment or whatever tribes. Yeah. And I think that's a balanced way to, uh, on the one hand, maximize the autonomy of each of the squads and the tribes. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, also uh, uh, build in the care for a number of important okay. um, so could IT you, concerns. Could you picture us a little bit how the, the new IT operating model really works? How, what, what kind of different groups are there? How would you, can you give us a, a, a bit of a, uh, an overall view? So, so as I said, the, um, the overarching, the overarching uh, uh, model um, is based on a Spotify model. Mm -hmm. So it's a model which is based on tribes. And then of course the first question to ask is what kind of tribes do you put in motion? I think what we try to do is um, make sure that it is tribes that um, are really focused on the priorities for Proximus. Mm -hmm. uh, with a specific focus, for example, on a significant part of the journey of customers. Think about selling, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, as I said, uh, in terms of resources, trying as much as we can to dedicate 100% and also have that capacity available in each of the tribes all the time with yep. dedicated resources that intimately cooperate every day on these matters. So you have redesigned the IT operating model. And, and so have you also redesigned your role? I mean, what, what is fundamentally your role as a CIO today in the organization? But it certainly comes with, uh, with indeed a different way of, uh, um, of dealing with an IT organization. Mm -hmm. um, I think first of all, and, and, and more than ever, if you look at also in our case, the kind of uh, importance of um, IT in the realization of all of the ambitions that we have, I think that's, uh, uh, that's quite significant. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's important as an IT leader to uh, be very close to that context of the company, to really well understand where we're heading, what the important priorities are, what that means in terms of our market that we, uh, that we are in. And then, of course, uh, uh, shape an organization that is able to, uh, uh, to deliver on that. But it is also capable, especially these days, to themselves bring new ideas to the table. It's no longer an organization that is just there to support uh, uh, implementation of, uh, I would say, uh, pre-chewed uh, pre uh, requirements. Yep. Uh, so I think that's, that's very important. Um, so on, on the one hand, it's about on many, on many things that we know will come our way if you want to anticipate, but on the other hand also embed in our structure the, um, the agility for the things that we're not sure of um, and to also make sure that indeed we can uh, um, contribute to, to, to differentiation and innovation. Yeah, but let's talk a bit more about the role of a CIO. I mean, you've been in the business for quite some time, so if you look at the role of the CIO five, ten years ago, the role of a CIO today and maybe also the role of the CIO in the future, how do you see that change? Uh, uh. I think if you look to, uh, to, to, to the past, the kind of uh, um, image that I have a bit is indeed um, IT leaders trying to, uh, to keep up with, with massive demand that was coming from all kinds of directions, uh, deliver as much as you can, mm -hmm. um, and of course spending also a lot of effort and time on trying to explain to everybody uh, why not everything is possible. Um, I was reading an article on that, and, and sometimes they call it the plumbers, the plumbers or the servicers as, uh, uh, as CIOs uh, at that time. I think, I think today that's no longer, uh, no longer sufficient. I think today the IT organization and, and, and especially leadership need to stimulate uh, um, experimenting on new stuff. Uh, again, promoting themselves new yeah. uh, uh, digital concepts, uh, but also have the ability to, to, to lead these kind of digital transformations. Okay. Let's talk a bit about um, your management style. Can you give us an idea of how many people in total there are in, in, in your teams and, and also how do you, what is your management style and how do you build successful teams? I think to me, um, uh, I, I'm really a strong believer in, in the collective power of a team. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really uh, very, very close to my heart. Um, I think from, an, from a leadership perspective, it's of course crucial to be very clear on where we are heading, what that vision is, what the priorities are, but then I think uh, make sure that we, uh, that we use the capacity of teams and leave also some freedom in, in I would say, the day-to-day -day decisions on where teams contribute to the end result uh, to make that happen. Uh, which of course doesn't mean that you leave them alone. I think that uh, um, a, a continuous interaction and communication is crucial uh, to make sure that you can also provide the support that is needed or on some of the things uh, help to change course if that's needed. Um, so that's, that's really important. And as it comes to teams, I think there's, um, um, 
I would say a couple of uh, basic and, 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 and hygienic uh, elements. I think you need to make sure that you have the competences in the teams mm -hmm. uh, and, and the right level of diversity. Uh, but I think next to that, and, and, and I think especially as you think about the, the agile way of working, making sure that you can create an environment um, of, of psychological safety where people really feel comfortable mm -hmm. to get involved, to learn, to experiment, um, but also to, uh, to challenge. Yeah. Okay. Now, like you say, it's the people that do the work, especially in, in, in our business. Um, so how, what's your secret? Uh, in attracting and motivating and growing your your teams because that's I mean that's especially attracting and, and keeping good people it's not an easy thing but also making sure that they grow so so what, what's your your approach there well I think indeed as you say today it's a bit of a challenge eh? because I think in uh, in um, in many markets and I think the, the same is true in Belgium uh, it's certainly uh, uh, for, pe for good people there's no lack of options to find uh, uh, exciting uh, exciting uh, initiatives uh, so, so I think that's important, that at least you're able to, um, to offer exciting initiatives and, and, and inspiring journeys for people to yeah. come on board. I think that fit well into a good story and a purpose of the company. I think it's important to be, uh, to be clear on that. Um, and with people on board, I think to, uh, um, to leave them some space to really be, um, to develop, yeah. but also to take some of the decisions on what they do day to day themselves uh, and not, uh, um, not being overly, uh, overly instructive. Um, and then making sure that indeed you can continue to, um, to expose them to different things so yeah. that they're able to develop and, and, and evolve. So Geert, finding the right people, keeping the right people is not an easy thing, but I mean, people watching this video, young, ambitious, uh, digital talent, why should they come and work for you? If you think about uh, uh, inspiring and exciting missions, I think if you look at all the things that we are doing, um, especially as part of our, um, of our strategy, if you think about building out the new networks, uh, really focusing on the new next level of digital experiences, all the stuff that we do in data, I think there's, I think uh, um, on, all, on all of the fronts and also in all of the areas, I would say, um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of IT, that we're really uh, working on, on, on uh, cutting edge uh, type solutions um, and, and, and really with, uh, uh, with an inspiring uh, goal in front of us. Yeah. So if you're ambitious IT talent, you, you have a candy shop where they can uh, do many different you, indeed, uh, jobs. Indeed. And, okay. So tell me a little bit more about your, uh, uh, about your leadership style, because managing people is one thing, really being a great leader is another thing. And, and can you give me an example of your leadership style? Well, I think to me, um, um, Passion for what you do and, and, and energy is, is, is very important. So um, I'm personally, um, first of all, interested in many different things. Um, and so also pretty enthusiastic about a lot of things. And that's also what I try to use to uh, take along people as we want to get uh, things done. Um, really conveying that energy and enthusiasm, um, trying to get in motion with the team. That's what I like, uh, what I like the most. Um, being there in support of a team, uh, especially in times where things are getting a bit more tough. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, I'm not too much easily stopped by obstacles or hurdles along the way. I think that's a, a point that, that uh, maybe uh, kind of stimulates me a bit to uh, uh, maybe beyond logical and linear thinking to try to do different things and, and, and maybe see if there's alternative ways to, uh, to get things addressed. Uh, I think perspective is important. Um, I think we're all overwhelmed by many different, important, urgent topics, uh, short term, longer term. How do you keep that all in balance and how do you make sure that you keep the focus on the things that really matter? Yeah. Because it's easy to get uh, um, kind of uh, um, to, be, to be dragged into this. Um, also in, in moments of crisis, I think um, in moments of crisis that um, I try to, to stay composed. Uh, to keep the energy focused on, on, on what we try to achieve um, and to, uh, to continue evaluating, thinking, trying and, and, and keep moving. Okay. Um, and as you think about perspective, I think a good sense of humor is also very important. To me. If I would go uh, to your offices, walk around, talk to some people, uh, and when you're not around, what do you think they will say about you, about the way that you lead them and, uh, and, and that you uh, work there? Well, of course, because I'm not there, I'm, I would never be sure, but... Um, I think we, um, as we also stimulate and value feedback a lot, um, I think I also get feedback from time to time. And I think uh, there's 
quite some consistency that I found, find in, 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 in feedback that people give me and, and maybe some of the elements that I mentioned. Maybe some of the, something that people would mention that I haven't mentioned is that sometimes I can be a bit impatient. Impatient? Um, and maybe a bit pushy from time to time. Okay. So um, I'm sure that would pop up and it's a fair feedback. Okay, good. So you're clearly a very energetic, passionate uh, professional. Um, but if at the end of the week, if you go home, what is it that needs to be, have happened so that you, you feel really happy? Another way to ask the same thing is what really drives you in, in, in your work? I think for me, the, um, the energizing part is really together with other people, shape, um, inspiring plan on something, uh, get going, try to find solutions to, uh, to the problems that you meet, mm -hmm. um, enjoying as well, I think, the um, enriching experience of interacting with others. Mm -hmm. And hopefully at some point, and I think it's also important to me, um, you can think, work on things that maybe come out with results within three, five years from now, mm -hmm. but to also have the, um, the possibility to, um, together with the team, to share the, the joy and the satisfaction of, of getting something done. Yeah, because you shared with us that your MBTI profile is, you're an ENTP, also known as a visionary, as a debater. People with this profile, they're, they're energetic and, and they, they like to start new, new yeah. things. They're not necessarily good at, at finishing things. So how, and, and of course in your job, you need to finish, you need to deliver the results. And you talked about that drives you as well. Where did you learn also to get pleasure from, from, uh, from finishing things and focusing on projects? I think there's, uh, there's probably two, uh, two aspects uh, to that. I think I recognize some of the things that you, uh, that you mentioned um, and probably naturally that um, generating the next idea and starting the yeah, next thing is, like. is more joyful than, than uh, getting into the nitty gritty details yeah. of, uh, of all of that. So I think on the one hand, it's um, I think being conscious about it. Mm -hmm. And if you want, trying to find ways to at least get that anchored in, in, in how you behave. Um, but I think it's also a matter of, uh, of team setup. Um, I've myself been in teams with a lot of such profiles and then indeed there's no lack of ideas, okay. there's no lack of imagination and enthusiasm about a lot of new things happening, but sometimes also big frustration on things that never happen yeah. uh, until, the, until the end. So I think really important there as part of a team, as we talk about diversity, to make sure that indeed you have a good balanced setup in terms of these profiles. Yeah. Uh, and I think sometimes to have, and I have personally also in my team, uh, uh, some profiles which are for example much more in MBTI as focused that can be sometimes very irritating for end people, uh, uh, but very helpful. Yeah. But also the J is important, no? I mean, if you're know, the, the, the perceiving type, you need in your team people Indeed. to say, okay, now this is the plan and this is what we're gonna do and, and, and now we're gonna act on it. And, and because, you, yeah. I mean, your challenge is that not to redesign again and again and again. Indeed, yeah, Correct. I think that's indeed also an, uh, an, uh, an element that is pretty uh, recognizable. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's, yeah, maybe sometimes a bit, uh, it may be a, in a way a fear of getting stuck in something which is too rigid, yeah. but maybe the other extreme is uh, that, you, uh, that you leave too much uh, options open and that you want to change yeah. uh, things all the time, which is of course indeed for other people that are much more G-type profiles yeah. a, night, a yeah. nightmare. Because e ENTPs that tend to be bold, creative, energetic, they deconstruct and rebuild ideas with the mental agility and their pursue goals despite resistance. So uh, resistance is not a problem we can grow through that. And by the way, we share the, uh, uh, the profile. Uh, so uh, people with our profile, typically they can be very knowledgeable, quick thinkers, original, excellent brainstormers, charismatic, energetic. We recognize that, we don't need to go into that. <laughs> Let's look at the, at, the, at the flip side of the coin and, and, and uh, domains where I'm sure you had to develop yourself as a professional. And that is ENTPs can be very argumentative. We mm -hmm. want to win the argument just for yep. the sake of winning the <laughs> argument. We can sometimes be insensitive because we're, we're yep. very rational and, and so we need to develop the, the, emo, the emotional, uh, the, the relationship side of things. Sometimes intolerant for people that are not that quickly in thinking difficult to focus and, and sometimes we dislike practical matters. Yeah, Which of these it. domains do you, um, do you recognize and how did you overcome that? Because you, you have to be sensitive, you have to be tolerant, you need to focus and so on. So how did you develop as a professional in these domains? 
Very again, I think I very much recognize uh, the things that you uh, that you mentioned. Um, I think first important starting point is is to um, to be aware of it, to be conscious about it, to be open for feedback on it. Um, and as you talk about, for example, being sensitive, uh, I remember it was a bit of a of a shocking fair feedback of somebody um, who told me that um, he liked to work with me, but that the early weeks and months that he worked with me, that he had an experience of somebody who was very cold, not interested in anything personal, but just the hard things that we were trying to, uh, yeah. to achieve, which was a good feedback, which was a bit of uh, a shocking feedback at that moment. <laughs> um, but indeed, it's, it's, um, it's being conscious of that, looking for feedback on it, and, and uh, um, trying to discover the value of some of the other, uh, some of the other elements. Yeah. Okay, now you're talking about values. Let's, let's dive a little bit deeper. And um, you have a family and children uh, here? Indeed. How old are your kids? A daughter of 17 and a an, uh, son of uh, 23, almost. Okay, super. And tell me about what are the, the core values that, that you have passed on to your children? What are the core values that you live by yourself and that are important for you? But I think, first of all, if you have the magic recipe on education of children, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to listen to that. Um, so I'm not sure about what of that is really thanks to me. Um, but, but what I'm really happy to, uh, uh, to observe is that um, they attach great value to integrity. Mm -hmm. um, I think they, um, they are supportive to others. I think they care about other people and are supportive to other uh, people. Um, but also, an, and certainly in these, these times, um, are open-minded and trying to create a balanced, non-judgmental view on things. Mm -hmm. uh, not overly simplistic. Um, and of course, they will tell you that they are much, much more funny than I am, but they share a good sense of humor, I think. Okay. Here, do you have a, a personal mantra, a saying that helps you in difficult times or that, that, well, that, that, you, that comes back all the time? I think we probably um, we touched upon it uh, uh, earlier. Um, I feel that, that, that generally people sometimes feel too much constraints and, and, and reasons why things are not possible. Um, while, of course, you will find examples of the opposite, I sometimes realize that things at first sight uh, might look more complex than they are. Mm -hmm. um, and so I very much believe, and then I'm also trying, I think, to, 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 to promote that a bit, uh, the belief that there is a solution to every problem. Mm -hmm. So um, to not give up too easily, um, keep thinking, keep evaluating, keep trying, uh, and, and keep going. Okay. Geert, you're very, clearly a very passionate guy. So I, your, your job is your passion, uh, I, I can imagine. Uh, learning is a passion, IT is, is, is certainly a passion because that changes every, yeah. every couple of years. So that's, that's something that you like, uh, I can imagine. But uh, outside of work, where, where are your passions there? What is it that excites you, that, that keeps you busy? Well, first of all, there's of course limited time for that. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, as I mentioned, I'm interested in many things, so the difficulty that I have a bit is to make strong choices there. So I like to play tennis, but I'm certainly not the best tennis player. Uh, I would like to do it sometimes with friends, with family. Mm -hmm. um, I started uh, playing guitar a couple of years back, and uh, people asked me uh, just a few days ago how far I am on that, and I told them that I'm still on my three chords that I can play, well. but not too quickly. Um, so, um, Next to that, I love sailing, of course, something that you can't do every day, uh, but enjoying, I would say, the company of friends, being a bit confronted with the forces of nature. Mm -hmm. um, certainly a very passionate, uh, a passionate interest. Um, so yeah, probably I could go on a bit, but, but nothing very particular, I must say. Uh, okay. In your life, who are the people that you look up to and, and who are maybe the mentors that you encountered in your life? That, who are the people that you have learned from? In fact, um, to me, that's a bit of a hard, uh, a hard question because um, I did not have until now big, if you want, idols, people that you really look up to for, for multiple reasons and that maybe you admire and adore. Um, and that's maybe because of the fact that I also believe in the capacity and the value of developing different things. And so there's very, maybe sometimes obvious examples that you could think of of people with great capacities, but 
sometimes somewhat overshadowed by big shortcomings. And so that uh, pushes me back a bit. But I think um, that for me it means there's a lot to learn from many people, whether it's famous or infamous people. Mm -hmm. um, and so if I would think about uh, a mentor and, and, and a good, call it maybe a bit of a non-famous example, then I would think about my father. And what did you learn from him? Um, so in fact, unfortunately, he's no longer there. I lost him uh, much too, uh, too quickly. But I think it's, um, first of all, a level of modesty. Um, and I'm probably not up to that level. Um, I think a high level of integrity. Mm -hmm. um, interesting opinion on a diversity of topics, not just one single thing. Um, very supportive to people and especially, and again, much, much more than what I potentially will ever reach, I think, high level of empathy and true listening skills. Um, and certainly a great sense of humor. In your personal life, what would you describe as being one of the best things, and don't say marrying my wife yeah, and no, no, my no, children, no. but one of, because of course these are the best things, but tell us what would be, would you describe as one of the best things that ever happened to you? Well, there, in fact, I would not think about, indeed, a very discretionary moment, and of course, uh, there's some of these that, that were very, very good, uh, very good experiences. But I think if, if I look at it overall, mm -hmm. then it's, I would say, especially the fact that um, I've been able to grow and evolve, either as part of a warm family, mm -hmm. either as part of a professional context which has offered possibilities to uh, grow and evolve, where you feel included, where you feel that you can uh, contribute and also get some recognition for that. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's more rather than a very particular experience, the kind of journey um, and, 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 and that kind of feeling that goes with it, personally, both as, as professionally. Okay. And what would you say is, is one of the worst things that has ever happened in your life? I have usually a bad memory for bad things. Mm -hmm. But if there is one that I would think of, um, then it would be the loss of my father. And maybe for the reason that I just mentioned a minute ago. Um, I lost my father at, at the age of 35. Um, at early. the point where I was really, I kind of felt that he was indeed a great support and a great mentor on many things. Um, and so yeah, that, that was hard because it came, it came unexpectedly, mm -hmm. very quickly. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, how, how do you get over that? I think, um, Time in a way heals uh, uh, for sure, but I think in the end it's especially, um, uh, I would say, the gratefulness and also the examples of some of the things that I mentioned um, that remain today. Yeah. And what, 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 what was the most important feeling in there? The feeling that you now you don't have the support anymore, that you're now the 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 the, the last responsible and things. Yeah. Is, yeah. That you're on your own from, from that? Yeah, in a way, it's maybe that. It's maybe that because um, if I could, if you want, very openly test ideas, exchange views on things. Um, and and, and if I, I think certainly at that point, I probably did not have 10 people with whom I could, could, could do that. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, a bit the fact, as you say, to, um, to have the feeling of all of a sudden being a bit unexpectedly on your own. And now it's up to you. By the way, also in terms of uh, um, uh, if you want support for the family. Yeah, absolutely. Let's, for one moment, go back to uh, professional life. I mean, you, uh, and it's interesting that um, I've, I've interviewed many, many CIOs now. There's not so many ENTPs, and although ENTPs love to do many different things, they tend to be very loyal to organizations. And so you also worked for a long time uh, in, uh, in, in, in Proximus, and you made big successes in there. But I'm sure that, like everybody, you made some big mistakes in there as well. You had your, uh, your, your part of the failures. Is, without being indiscreet, but <laughs> <laughs> is there one project or one thing that you can share with us that you will say, well, that was really a brilliant failure? And, and, what, was, and what did you learn from your most brilliant failure? I think there's certainly one that I think of uh, some time back a big project that we start, under pressure to get it delivered as quickly as possible. Um, and of course, in hindsight, things are always easier, uh, but also trying to, um, to rip out in no time an, an, a historical implementation with lots of complexities. 
um, start going on that. Um, and then of course find out after, typically, diving a bit deeper into the subject, that it's much more complex mm -hmm. and that indeed, as we, as we were mentioning, that the timing of it and potentially also the cost and the effort uh, will be much more extensive. And so there comes the difficult choice at some point in time to either uh, push through or uh, to put a stop to it yep. and uh, also have the courage to say maybe it's better to just put a halt to this, um, which is finally what, uh, what we did. Um, then trying to, um, to contain as much as I could the damage of it, because of course there was some effort and, and, and money spent on it. Um, spent months basically trying to, uh, to get to an, um, an arrangement with also some of the partners that were involved to, uh, to minimize the damage of that. Yeah. Um, without mentioning the numbers, but it was still to me very material numbers. And then surprisingly, as I presented it to, um, to our uh, executive committee at the time, I got, um, I got a thank you, which was a bit of an annoying feeling to me because I felt like this is a failure. By the way, we've also thrown some money out of the window. Yeah. Um, but I think the way it was, it, it was addressed and, and, and where we tried at least to make the best out of it, although it was an, a very dramatic situation, mm -hmm. um, was, um, was still appreciated. But again, it felt, felt very annoying. Learnings from that, learnings from that uh, to me is for sure, and I think that's something that we all fight against every day, Again, there's lots of things that are urgent. Um, but what is really urgent? And if you're thinking about something that, I say something, will take two years, how fast do you want to be on making the fundamental choices on what you're going to do for the next two years? Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I think, not getting into the last nitty gritty detail, but making sure that on the essential pieces of how you will approach it, how you will get things done, you've well thought about it, put that plan in motion, which has, if you want the ingredients of success, yep. is I think crucial. And so not sometimes be overly... Uh... So what you're saying is make sure if there's an important project to have the fundamental try Indeed. first before jumping in and then start Indeed. doing, and that you have, I don't know, the, the architecture, the people, the, the, the approach, the plan yeah. uh, before, yeah. you get, um, before you get started. Great. Back to more uh, a personal note. In your life, what is it that you would say you would, would fear most and what is it that you love most? By fear, if I think about uh, um, fear, I must say um, I have been over the last months, uh, uh, what has really struck me is um, something that I believe was, was in our case part of history books, uh, brutality on, 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 on people and, 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 and war in, in Europe, if you want. Yeah. Um, which to me feels like very uncomfortable because it, it, it affects indeed many, many things of, uh, of, of society and kind of um, yeah, challenges a bit maybe some of the things that we, we took for granted. So uh, that's to me a bit of a... Um, and again, there's probably not much I can do about it, but mm -hmm. uh, sometimes uh, keeps me awake. Uh, but in terms of, um, in terms of uh, uh, joy and fun moments, uh, I think we mentioned, uh, we mentioned the family, I think uh, spending joyful time with indeed my um, fantastic wife, daughter, uh, son, and also, like many people since COVID, a dog. Okay. Um, that's fantastic. And what kind of dog do you have? It's a golden retriever, oh. but it doesn't retrieve anything, he especially eats. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is it that you would say that you are most grateful for in your life? I think what I'm most grateful for is... Um, the fact that, of course, things, things are not always easy and sometimes it's hard and, 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 and the road might be a, a, bit, a bit bumpy from time to time. But mm -hmm. overall, if I look at it, that have been, um, I've been offered, I think, a lot of opportunities, both personally as professionally. Yeah. Um, and I think always in a, in a context where I was surrounded by, I would say, supportive and, and very trustworthy people. Mm -hmm. And so that I'm really grateful for. Okay. We all have our good things, our bad things, and, and, some, and some things we're really, really good. And so uh, what is it that you would say is your number one gift that you have and that you can use in your, your life and your business? I think to me it's uh, related to, um, I would say, level of optimism. And uh, as a result of that, um, the energy and passion uh, on many different subjects that you can use to also energize others. and, and, and mobilize people uh, to also with, uh, with great energy get things done. Okay. 
These videos are being watched by ambitious young digital talents that uh, want to follow in uh, your footsteps and I want to become a CIO of large corporates. What would the advice be that you would give to, uh, to them? My advice would be um, look for the thing that you're really passionate about. Um, not only that you're good at, but that you're passionate about. Pursue your aspirations on that. Um, and don't be too much overwhelmed by either uncertainty or expectations uh, uh, of other people. And, uh, and believe that there is a solution to every problem. Okay. On that note, Geert, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing all your uh, experiences and visions. Well, really a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.